What the? I bid you welcome. Shadow Man, one of my favourite Nintendo 64 action platformers, was released not too long ago for the Switch, receiving a much needed makeover from the team at Night Dive. It looks and plays better than ever, and it's well worth a go if you fancy a classic Tomb Raider style adventure with a dark twist. So in this video, we'll be doing the usual, taking a look at some out of bounds secrets, behind the scenes developer tricks, easter eggs, and something a little different, because we'll also be looking at general comparisons between the remastered and the original title. Before we start that, huge thank you to everyone who supported the channel recently by hitting the thumbs up on any of the videos. It really does help to build the channel, and if you do want to see more content then be sure to hit the subscribe button too. Also feel free to come and join me on Discord if you have any out of bounds secrets you'd like me to check out, and I'll see what I can do. Dark Souls are mine. Alright, so we begin in the sewers under London, and as the camera pans around, we end up seeing the infamous Jack the Ripper in his hideout, who then speaks to Legion. How did you find this place? Who are you? My name is Legion. See, his name is Legion, but just in case you were wondering what it looks like from the outside of the map, here it is. So the camera pans around at tunnels heading in this direction, and as you can see, Jack's hideout is just down the long stretch, which ends up leading to nowhere, except a vast skybox. The other question is, where does Legion come from? He can be found just out of bounds of the doorway to Jack's hideout, of course, in the classic t pause. Something I wanted to take a look at during the intro was the signs that we can't quite read on the building across from the apartment in the Wild at Heart. And this sign in particular reads something like, Jack, totally delicious thy wing. What the f***? Surely this can't be on the original N64 version. Well, actually, yep, you can just about make it out. Whether it's a coincidence that paint stain covers the sign the way it does will probably remain a mystery, but I'd actually be curious to find out what the full sign is supposed to read. However, moving on from that revelation about Jack and what may be inside the factory, something that I found pretty cool was how the developers had created this town, then covered it with a night sky texture, all within the dead side boundary box, which we'll talk a little more about later on. I think the only thing left to do here is to take a peek inside the apartment, which has a few cool little details, such as the newspaper on the floor, which appears to be an article about a killer who masterminds a prison siege. A very cool detail, which you'd never normally get to see, but ties in with the storyline. Another cool detail is the book listing the five serial killers that we'll be dealing with later in the game can be seen on the cabinet. The next part of the intro is protagonist Michael Loire travelling through a valley on a boat, though going out of bounds and looking at the map from above, we can see if he was to continue along this route, he wouldn't exactly get too far. Of course, once the cutscene finishes, luckily for us, a new part of the map loads and we can continue on with our journey. Sticking with this overhead view, we can also take a look at how different parts of the map appear and disappear as we move throughout the map hitting certain trigger points. These are of course strategically placed by developers, so the player can never see this happening through the normal camera view. Just like many games, even to this day, the characters do spawn into a scene and despawn one out of shot. It is that simple, so we're not going to spend too much time looking at this. However, a question that I did want to answer, and something that I did find quite interesting, is if we mix those two scenarios together by deloading the map whilst having an NPC in that sector, what happens to them, particularly the enemy NPCs that roam freely? Well, if you watch carefully, you'll notice that whilst the sector of map is deloaded, the NPC also despawns, and the character coordinates are also frozen to their last position before moving out of bounds. So then, as soon as we hit the trigger to load the sector of map back up again, you're going to see the sister is free to move once again.
I just about remember playing Shadow Man when it was released back on the Nintendo 64, and one thing that I remember in particular was being impressed by the scale of the Asylum Courtyard. Of course, it looks much better on the remaster, but let's not take anything away from the original. From Outer Bounds way up above the map, we can see how the Asylum in both versions is simply several sections of flat textures. Even still, the way it towers over the courtyard gives a great impression of its giant size. I also want to just compare a few other details from the Nintendo 64 version to the remaster, as there has been several items and even full segments added. So this remaster isn't just an improvement of graphics, here we can see how the developers have removed small bugs that remained in the final Nintendo version. For instance, Nette is stood on the ground, whilst on the N64 she's floating above it. Voodoo maybe? As I said, there have been some major changes added, including full segments that were cut from the original. Take for instance this part of the Temple of Life, leading to where we collect the baton. In the remaster, this part isn't such a simple task. First, rather than just dropping into the circular room, there are a few more obstacles to overcome, and then when we finally get into the circular room, there's a full-on enemy boss style encounter with Yacht. <laughs> Other major additions are full new maps including a summer camp where there's clearly something sinister gone down. This is now where we find and fight Milton Pike. Hey, you! This is private property! This is, of course, rather than at the prison. Hey, you! This is private property! Where in the original, we also found Marco, rather than at his new scrapyard, where he likes to do a little old-school disco dancing. Which brings me nicely onto some secrets and easter eggs, the first one being right here in Marco's disco hall, where if you've decided you've had enough of the music, simply shoot the speakers to make our protagonist say this. Consider that a service to music lovers everywhere. Still at Marco's scrapyard, take this corridor that's hidden just off the correct route, and if you enter this strange glowing light, well, something very out of the ordinary happens even for Shadow Man. The prison features much more in the original than the remaster, but take a look at this little developer easter egg, added by who I would imagine would be a texture artist. It's certainly not in the original, and if we flip it over, it reads, If you can read this, hi. If you cannot read this, hi. Take care, Carrot. Nice work, Carrot. A little mystery easter egg can be found in the area known as the playrooms. In the original game, there is only one cell, and if we enter, nothing can be found inside. However, whilst playing through the remaster, I noticed a couple more cells had been added, and this is where the mystery begins. Because in one cell, on the very back wall, a note in what looks like blood can be found. It reads, I've been a very bad boy. I do wonder if this is Carrot again. Though the mystery does go deeper than this, because in the second cell, where the original cell would be, we can also find some scissor stencil shapes all over the walls, ceiling and floor, all in seemingly random directions. This does make me wonder if this has any further meaning, or maybe a clue to a bigger mystery. Could it be these are some sort of trigger and we have to interact with them somehow? I'm not too sure, maybe they are just totally random, but if that is the case then why put them here? It would be great to hear what you think in the comments. Alright, we're going to take a look at some out of bounds secrets and development tricks now, starting off with how we travel between the living and dead side. If we take a look from outside the funnel of light, we can see that is exactly what it is, a funnel shaped texture 
that leads to a point at the end. Simple, but effective. What about out of bounds from the map of Deadside? Well, to be honest, there certainly isn't anything out there that I could find that's hidden as a secret as such. Mainly, we can see this huge perimeter of mountains and sky that enclose the map. So what happens if we try to take a look outside of this? Well, as you can see, the camera and the surround are both bound to each other. So even though the camera is moving, the surround will move with it, which makes it look as though the map is moving even though that is still, and it'll disappear through the surround. I hope that makes sense. So, how do we look outside the surround? Well, what I had to do was unbind the two and move the entire surround sideways. Here's what it looks like when I did. We get this crazy stretching effect of whatever is rendered on the screen. This is because normally we would never be able to see outside the surround, so there is absolutely nothing out here. Except there can't be absolutely nothing out here when we are here looking at it. So, what happens is, the end of whatever is rendered gets stretched across to fill the void, and this is what gives us this effect. What I love about Shadow Man is all the cutscenes are done in real time. There is no pre-rendered cutscenes, and I think it's great to see how these look from other camera angles. One scene in particular I was interested to look at is when we take the train to the Asylum Cageways. It seems that when we run through the train to the engine carriage, the next part of the map loads up automatically, before we set off. Therefore, unless I'm mistaken, the cutscene of the train speeding through the tunnel is for immersion purposes only. Alright, so we are coming towards the end now. Just a quick little tip, if you've ever tried to catch up to Luke, then you probably found that you weren't quick enough. Mainly because Luke can use the force and can teleport when we hit certain trigger points. Also, just in case you did ever wonder how Luke turns into Legion and then Legion turns into some of the other characters, including different versions of himself, or itself, then these are quick model swaps as the camera changes on the necessary frame. The other models, such as Luke, can then be found hidden way out of bounds. Upon your pissant little world. The throne awaits you, Michael Lavoie. You are the fuel for a great engine, as it was in the beginning, is now, and forever shall be. Amen to that! This is the end, beautiful friend!